Well, that was certainly one of those documentaries that kinds of puts a lot of weight on, no pun intended, puts a lot of weight on you, kind of tears you down and then builds you back up and inspires you at the end. And hopefully we can do some of that here uh, tonight as well. I want to start out having each of our panelists talk about kind of their perspective on this. And I want to start with Dr. Joe because we've had conversations about this before. And, and I know, especially in your time as a pediatrician, you've seen many things, including now a need to address diabetes differently because of this. And if you could discuss some of that for us. Sure, and I want to thank everyone for being here. I think this is probably one of the biggest challenges we have, uh, no pun intended. It's hard to talk about obesity because of the, the, the issues. I think this is equal to the tobacco risk that we had in the 20th century. Uh, it was not much more than 70 years ago where half of people smoked. You had doctors advertising as we saw in the film. And today in our state, to, we have more than two thirds of our adults that are obese. We have more than 10% that have been already diagnosed with diabetes. And we have 38% of our kids that are either obese or overweight on the path to the same trajectory. And so it's not gonna be a simple solution, but this is one that we all have to take heed and start doing individual efforts each and every day to rebalance the calories we take in with those that we burn off. Uh, Kendrick is the youngest and therefore the coolest person on this panel tonight. Uh, <laughs> could you tell us, you know, What's the perception that you see out there in, in, in schools and, and in the younger community with this issue right now? Well, coming from this cool perspective, I can uh, let it be known that I can speak from some personal experience. Uh, before getting involved with uh, different things that help provide healthier changes for myself, I used to be overweight, and I also come from the Big Easy, New Orleans, Louisiana. <coughs> so, you know, I'm very accustomed to good tasting food. And being younger, I know that uh, Coming from that background, I wasn't going to pick the broccoli over a nice piping bucket full of crawfish. So I was going to go for those unhealthier things. And if it weren't for the fact that people were making the initiative to help <coughs> change the things that were going on within uh, people coming from my standing. Uh, before I was involved with the Alliance for Healthier Generation, I was a member of their youth advisory board. And the strides that they've made to help decrease the obesity epidemic has just helped me to realize that if there's someone, there's some driving force behind that in order to help in something like so drastic, then coming from this perspective, we can make it be known that, hey, they actually care about, you know, what I'm going through and what people like me are going through and that that change can occur. So Jamie, we've obviously already seen what you've been doing. What was it like when you first started showing up and having these screenings, what kind of acceptance was there? How much time did it take to get more acceptance? And, and is there still a ways to go with, with what they've been doing? When we first started our program, the perception was it's not, it's not the company's business. Um, and, and so it's taken, it took a couple of years to establish a rapport and a relationship with these guys. And y'all can appreciate, I mean, I got a bunch of redneck guys, so they think, you know, the company's going to put chips under our skin and they're going to, you know, track us when we go home. And there was a lot of conspiracy theory. I mean, really. And, but once they, they realized that we were there to help and that we were not going to be in their business, we were going to plant some seeds. And if they chose to, to allow those to grow, we were there. But if not, that was, that was their decision. And so what we found was some of the guys were a little apprehensive at first, but they'll catch out in the parking lot. Hey, what, what are my bulldozers? Or, you know, I need to get my triglycerides down. Or please don't call my wife and tell her. What do I need to do? <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll use whatever, we, whatever uh, methods possible um, to reach these guys. So it's really been a blessing. So Jenny, the Alliance has been around seven years now? That correct? And you've been working all over the country, but of course have had strong ties with the Clinton Foundation with Arkansas. What do you see Arkansas's position is as opposed to the rest of the country in, and I guess both the problem and how we're starting to address it? So uh, the Alliance does work all over the country with more than 14,000 schools with uh, more than two and a half million young people 
uh, and uh, like Kendrick. And, you know, Arkansas is a real pace setter in the work that has happened already, um, much due to a lot of the work that Dr. Thompson has done and others in the state to really set strong policies and then an implementation plan to make differences in schools and communities across the state. So it's been exciting over the six or seven years that the alliance has been in existence to really uh, look at what's happening in Arkansas, really point to the success stories that are happening here uh, when we work in other parts of the country, particularly the southeast. Uh, so it's been exciting to see um, the shifts here. And Al, coming from a, an academic standpoint, how much do you see the conversation and participation when we're talking about public service and public policy? Do you think it's starting to shift as much as it needs to toward addressing this issue, or, or are, are we a long way from where we need to be? Um, I think there is a shift. Uh, certainly, there's a, a lot more work that needs to be done. Uh, you know, it, it was nice to see uh, in, in the video what's going on in Arkansas. I think that's uh, very, very healthy. Uh, because as uh, you know, uh, Dr. Thompson said earlier on, uh, when it comes to obesity, Arkansas is way up there, and uh, we certainly want to see those numbers come down. Uh, what's, what I've seen uh, based on uh, you know, the literature and my own observation and my own involvement is that there is uh, indeed a very serious effort to bring this uh, 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 epidemic down a little bit. Uh, and so there have been efforts in the past. I know there are lots of communities involved. Uh, there is a, a current program going on right now uh, sponsored by uh, the Department of Health uh, Independence County in uh, North Little Rock uh, actively involved in the CPPW program. It's called uh, Communities Putting Prevention to Work, uh, in which they uh, take some of the things that are discussed in the video actually into practice, you know, where they are opening up gyms in uh, elementary schools for the public to come in and, and participate. They are changing well, uh, wellness policies in the workplace, uh, as well as schools to increase the healthy choices. So there are things taking place, and, and quite frankly, at this point, we've taken a, you know, some benchmark data that suggests that, you know, indeed, you know, once some of those changes are implemented, we hope to see some changes. And so it's going to take a series of uh, efforts, including changing the environment, as we saw, in the video, it includes changing the systems that we have in place right now, and certainly we need the help of the policymakers to change the policies that we have. Thank you. So I'm going to throw a, a few questions out, and then we'll open it up to the to the audience, and everyone can have their own say as well. And this these questions are just for anyone, the first person to think of an answer. Just things I thought of watching this. What are some of the advantages and disadvantages that you think Arkansas has for the kind of change that they're talking about, the grassroots change. Uh, you know, we, we can talk a lot about policy from the top down, but at the grassroots level, looking at some of the things we saw in Conway, obviously, but in other parts of the country, where do you think that we're in a good position to make progress, and where do you think we might have a harder time making progress? And anyone who wants to jump in, I all your mics are on. So. I'll, I'll jump in and start. You know, I, think, I think the locally grown food opportunities that we have in this state, it's not too many decades ago that much of the tomato crop for the midsection of the nation was grown in Bradley County, or that the strawberries were grown in Lone Oak County, or that we had many other kind of locally grown major distribution points for the nation. We lost that as you saw, or lost much of that as you saw in the, in the video. But with Heifer Projects just down the street with their domestic commitment to locally grown food, with uh, Walmart, probably the largest food distributor in the world uh, on our northwestern corner, with a commitment to local growth, not just because of the health issue, but because their transportation costs are so high when they have to ship it from one site in the United States to all over the United States. We've got some raw or some raw materials, some, some, some clear assets that we could knit together and have a real local solution to a problem that, that I think was well reflected in the video. Uh, okay. uh, I think, you know, uh, one area where we probably might need to uh, 
probably put in a little extra effort is uh, getting the, the most vulnerable populations to be more actively engaged in this uh, effort. Uh, what typically happens in most cases uh, is that, you know, the vulnerable population, I'm talking of the under, underserved, as well as, you know, minority population and, and uh, economic, economically disadvantaged people uh, have other challenges that they have to face. You know, some of them are working two jobs, so that when you make those uh, physical activity facilities available to them, they probably don't even take advantage of those things. So it's uh, kind of challenging, and I think it will take a little extra effort to educate people to understand that you know this is, you know, uh, uh, something that's good for themselves as well as for society as a whole, and for their kids as well. So I think that would be something that we need to put a little extra effort in. Anyone else want to jump in on that? I'm I'm from Oregon, so I'm a non. I don't live here, so uh, my reaction is is relative to the rest of the country and I think Arkansas has an advantage in being a medium-sized state with a lot of people who have lived here for a very long time and are very passionate about the health and wellness of the state overall in, in a lot of different um, ways. And, you know, very similar to Oregon, where Oregonians are very proud of being from Oregon. Arkansians seem to be very proud of their state and really want things to move forward. And the fact that it's not so large that it's unmanageable, you can actually implement changes relatively quickly, yet you're large enough to be resource rich and really have great talent, great resources to make things happen. So I think that's a real advantage. Kendrick, let me put it on a more personal level with you because you've said as much you've fought your own battles in the past too. What was it that pushed you, you know, what was your teetering point? What pushed you over the edge where you decided for yourself that you had to do something and you had to get involved and take action? Well, it all began whenever I was chosen as a Let's Just Play Go Healthy Challenger on the Nickelodeon television station. And this was back in about 07, I believe. But during this time, it was a six month program and there was an episode per month. But beforehand, I was, say, 12 years old, going on 13. And coming from New Orleans and being a very lazy child who the only type of exercise he received was pushing buttons down on video games. Um, it took, as soon as we moved up here, because I'm from New Orleans, and I moved up to Arkansas post-Katrina, and as I'm saying, being on the Let's Just Play Go Healthy Challenge, I learned a lot of life lessons. And what motivated me to trying to make that change was the history of health uh, problems within my family. Uh, my brother had recently, right before I decided to be a part of this program, had a stroke at the age of 27. And so realizing that, I was, I'm just thinking to myself, I need to make a change because, you know, that could happen to me. And so whenever I got involved with the program, I started off about, I want to say, about 220 pounds. And I uh, didn't know how to ride a bike, didn't know how to swim, and I couldn't run to save my life. And over the six months, they decided to give me a goal, and the goal was to complete a triathlon. Now, this triathlon, <laughs> consists of a 100 miles or a 100 yard swim, a four mile bike ride, and a one mile run. Well, I couldn't swim or ride a bike. And I couldn't run to save my life. I was like, what are you doing? Why would you give me such a goal? But luckily, over the six months, I not only lost 40 pounds, but I learned how to swim, I learned how to ride a bike, and I was able to outrun anybody who was trying to chase me. <laughs> And we won't ask why people were trying to chase you, but we'll just say. Yeah. Just a figure of speech. <laughs> so, Jamie, when you're talking about, as you said, dealing with conspiracies and dealing with uh, a lot of resistance, was there, there one thing that you found over time that you were most able to connect with people on? To, were you able to start that shift to where they eventually grew to the acceptance you talked about earlier? I don't think there was one thing. It, it's, I mean, you think about what motivates each of you, and, and your motivations are different. So it was more about establishing the relationship so then I could learn what motivates you, what motivates you, what motivates you. And, and just having somebody on the ground and having the resources to back me from my executives was, was a foundation that I was able to continue to build. And, and that's what's allowed me, and plus these guys just trusting me. 
and, and I would go to the gym with them, to the doctor with them, um, into their homes. And that kind of, that kind of relationship, you can't buy with, with online or telephone counseling. That, that's what's made the difference for us. And, and you talk about positive relationships, this is for anybody. Do you see instances where, yes, there's relationships that help solve the problem, but do you see that there, where there are relationships that prevent the problem from being properly addressed? Because with the numbers that we're seeing now and the scale that we're seeing, there has to be something on a personal level for a lot of these people that's blocking any progress as well. Do you, do you see that or do you know where there's examples of that? You know, I have found, I'll give two, one is a parental and one is a physician example. I think, I think parents don't recognize the exposure risks that their kids have. I mean, one in three kindergartners has a TV in their room, and 50% of the commercials are for the foodstuffs that we saw on the, on the uh, television. And, and I think as a parent, you wouldn't actively expose your child to that risk if you had that knowledge. So I think part of this is getting that knowledge out there so that people find ways to balance the risks uh, uh, of excessive calories for their kids. The other I would say, and it's, it's probably a little more damning of, of my colleagues in the profession, but it, it was hard to get pediatricians to pay attention to childhood obesity. It was very easy to get family physicians to pay attention to childhood obesity because the family physicians were seeing diabetes start at an earlier and earlier age. It used to be you know, diagnosed at 50 and then 40 and then 30 and now as, as you were saying, I mean, the health issues start in the 20s. It wasn't until we started diagnosing adult onset or type 2 diabetes at age 15 until we really got the pediatricians to wake up and say, wait, maybe this is a big issue. So I'm a pediatrician, but I couldn't convince my colleagues that it was an issue until they were faced with the threat. And I think we need to do a better job of articulating the threat and tying it to real consequences. And I think that's how we're going to raise a lot of the grassroots initiatives around what we need to try to do. Do any of you see any hidden problems that people may not think about in their, in their communities or in their homes or things that, that are adding to the problem that didn't get attention in the film or, or that you see people deal with in their day-to-day -day lives but you may not think about as, as as big of a contributor to this? Something that came to my mind, like Jenny, I'm, not, I'm from the West Coast. And when I moved to the South and started attending potlucks and especially <laughs> Church potlucks, it's a, it's a culture of incredibly delicious food and, and none of it is good for you. And, but, but it's such an ingrained part of the, of the society and such an important part of the society, but of course is, is adding to the problem as well. Are there things like that that, that you see in other parts of life too? Um, <laughs> I, I have three kids and uh, you know, the, the, the 15 year old, you know, she's as thin as this pen. Uh, but she's one person who will not eat her fruits. She doesn't exercise. But I keep telling her that, you know, uh, the fact that she's thin doesn't mean that she's healthy. She needs to do these things. And so here I am, I think I'm fairly educated and I know what these things are, you know, and I share every information with them. And yet it's so hard for her to, you know, get into the mind frame where she's, you know, She's ready to listen to me and do those things. Uh, and so I'm thinking about you know, my situation and relating it to probably you know, those others out there who probably are not aware of the situation. And, and how do we educate them to get to understand that this thing can be very, very challenging. So uh, I, I'm thinking, just relating back to your question, you know, I'm, sh I'm sure there's a way to get a message across. And, uh, We've, we've actually set up a date that we'll be watching these videos when they sh <laughs> it's a show on the 14th. And I'm hoping that this will probably, you know, get her to really understand that, you know, there is something that somewhere down the road, it might have implications. So it's time to get started. It's time to get, uh, you know, the exercise going. The others I don't have too many problems with. Uh, in fact, there's one that, you know, probably we are the only two people who eat fruits in the house. Uh, and so I'm, I'm trying to think that, you know, Probably there should be a way to get a message across and you know between the hard hitting messages that we'll get from the video is there you know another way maybe the psychologist or some other folks might help us uh, so who knows maybe the other videos will get the message across. Jenny what are you seeing? I think I think there are a couple of themes one which was in the in the film and one that was 
subtly in the film, which makes sense because it was HBO, and that's screen time. I think uh, one of the things that we've seen in our data with the students that we work with across the country and is pretty consistent nationally is that television viewing is actually going down, but time in front of screens, whether it be, I guess, phones, computers, iPads, whatever they are, is greatly increasing, meaning physical activity time is decreasing. And if you couple that with what you saw in Santa Ana, where kids don't have places to play that are perceived to be safe, that's a real danger in terms of the physical activity side, coupled with um, the fact that so few kids are walking, biking to school and getting incidental physical activity. You know, I, I left my um, house right after school, after I did my homework, and I came back at dark, and I can't tell you how many people my age have, have shared that same story. That's just not the norm anymore. And if it is the norm, you're paying exor exorbitant real estate prices to make it the norm for your kid. And so I think that is an area where we just really need to continue to look for creative solutions like they did in Santa Ana. In, middle-income communities, in affluent communities across the country, as well as in uh, high-poverty communities. What about your, the employees you work with, Jamie? Are there, are there things that you point out to them that they just would never have thought of contributing to the level that it is in their life? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for my guys, I mean, they know the difference, I'm going to say, in right and wrong. You know that if you're going through a drive through and you're choosing a, a biggie size this and a biggie size that, you know that that's probably not going to be a healthy choice. They know that. But what we talk about is, so when you get, um, let's say, high cholesterol, are you going to just cruise through Taco Bell and ask them to buy your Crestor? <laughs> it's not going to work like that. So it's more about trying to get them to think of what's coming in the future and using their dollars for healthy choices. And I'll say, look, everybody eats out. I get that. But what are you choosing when you go? And, and it's about the balance. You can have the hamburger, but you can't have the french fries. You can do you know, a baked potato, or you can do a side salad, but you can't do them both. And, and, and so we really work on, on a balance. And, and they know. I mean, we know. We know, right? We know. And we went through, I'm, I'm, I did not. My, my mother went through, I know, Sonic, because it was happy hour. <laughs> and got her a Coke with, and my husband, and these were diet, but they still, I mean, we still, we still do have these behaviors, so it's, it's changing for our guys, um, but it's challenging. And how do you tell a guy, hey, I know it's 105 degrees outside, and I know it's 80% humidity, and you've been out there for 10 hours, but you need to go exercise when you go home. You know what they're going to tell me? They're going to say some ugly stuff, and then they're going to get a six-pack, they're going to sit on the couch, and they're going to turn on ESPN or HBO. <laughs> I just watched it. Stop. Do you have something, Kendrick, you want to give me? You don't need to. No pressure. Let me, let me jump in, and, and I, think, you know, I think one of the things that the film did very well is this is not going to come, a solution is not going to come with a magic bullet. This is about making so many changes in the environment within which we live. I want to echo my colleague on the end, and we're going to have to differentially invest in low-income communities and communities of color because they are, have been historically for decades affected more and to reverse it. And I'll just give an example for those of you who live here in Little Rock. If you go from the Kroger in Heights to the Kroger in Hillcrest to the Kroger on 12th Street to the Kroger on Roosevelt, there is a stepped degradation in the quality of food offered and in the healthiness of the food offered. And we've got to increase both the demands for healthier food and the supply for that healthier food if we want to have any hope of solving this issue. So I just want to, that, that's a concrete, if you have not done that, I challenge you to go to those four Kroger's and buy the same sack of groceries. You can't do it. So which is, the, which is the chicken and which is the egg? And that, do you think that, that happened, that disparity happened because of the demand, or do you think it was just market driven by the stores? I will say it doesn't matter. Yeah. We're in an epidemic. It is threatening our future. This is the first generation of kids who may not live as long as their parents. We have to work on both the chicken and the egg. We have to work on the education, which is the demand side, and we have to put pressure on the supply side, and hopefully we'll bring those together to find a solution. 
Well, I want to get questions from uh, the audience as well. We've got a, a microphone. We've got some microphones roving around, so if you'll raise your hand, we'll, uh, and I think this gentleman in the tie here had, had it first. I think Naples uh, are uh, amazing. It, there's a, if you'll notice in this audience, there are very few people are grossly obese, and that's the way that it always uh, is on programs on obesity. It's hard to reach the ones that need it the most. Did y'all use any kind of incentive, any carrot, pardon, <laughs> uh, a, a, a financial incentive reduction in uh, health insurance costs? Great question. <laughs> yes, we did. We, we are self-funded, and at Napoltz, the company pays 100% of the employee's um, monthly insurance premium. If you want your spouse or kids on there, then you're responsible for them. So when we um, initiated this program, it was voluntary. Um, you come in, you do the screening, you get 50 bucks. Well, what we found was we couldn't get everybody in. And we were concerned that the folks who didn't come in were potentially the most unhealthy. And I won't tell y'all what we found, because it was ugly. I'm, I'm talking life-threatening. And these folks either knew and ignored it or just didn't know. So from 2008 on, we have, um, we have a voluntold. So it's voluntary, but if you choose not to participate, then there's a stick. And that's you pay half of your monthly premiums. So we went from about 75% of our folks getting screened to guess what? 100% baby. <laughs> so what we've done is our, our employees get money based on their results. So the healthier you are, the more money you get. Now there's no penalty. Um, again, I can say, okay, Billy Bob, your cholesterol is off the charts. If you wanna do something about it, I'm here to help you. But if not, again, that's your business. And, and so we've gone to 100% participation. Y'all know how many of our folks get, get money? Wanna, anybody wanna guess what percentage of our folks get money? 99. 99% of our employees get money. And I, and I give this information back to the company. I share this with our employees, because again, we don't want the conspiracy theory. We're, we're an open book. If you want to know, we'll tell you. And those, and I put it out in a newsletter, 12 people got zero dollars because their health was so poor. I can tell you four of those 12 came to me and said, I'm embarrassed. I do not want to be zero dollars. And it wasn't about the money, it was really about, I don't, want, I don't want people to know that I got zero dollars. No, we don't put their names, there's no identifiers. Um, but so yes, and I tell y'all what we're doing this year is because our cholesterol's better, our sugar's better, our obesity and our tobacco are not moving. So we have a super incentive. And what we've done is if you choose to quit using tobacco and we have a little program, um, you can earn up to $500. And if you are obese and you meet certain benchmarks, you can earn up to 1,000. This is in addition to the 400 they can earn for their cholesterol, their sugar, their blood pressure, um, body fat, and tobacco. So we're, we're putting some money behind it. No sticks. Jamie, can I ask, how long did it take for you to see that return? And how, what was the message you used, as I'm sure you were asked, as you had to Expenses up front without that return, how long do we have to wait to see that return? What I would tell these guys is, if you have a heart attack because we're self-funded, it's gonna cost us about $70,000. So if I can prevent one heart attack or one diabetic going on dialysis, then it will cover the cost of this program very quickly. And, and it had, that y'all saw $600,000 a year, that's rocking. <laughs> we love to have that money back in our pockets to give to our employees with raises and bonuses instead of taking our profits to pay for our little health insurance problems over here on the side. So it's, it's really, and with 99% of our folks getting money, they're engaged. I mean, they're, I had a call the other day, two of my guys were like, okay, this is what we're talking about. Billy Bob said that the symptoms are the signs of a heart attack or this, this, and this. And I said it was this and this. <laughs> Who's right? And I was like, really? That's what we're talking about on the job site? That's great. And I'm like, you're wrong and he's right. You know, so, so it's wonderful. I mean, this, these changes are really happening. They're slow. You know, I'm getting Billy Bob's and Jimmy George's here and there, but, but it's happening. But there's a lot of money. <laughs>
And thank you, sir, for your compliment about the general fitness of the room as well. I appreciate that. <laughs> Clearly there are different self-perceptions and we've seen a migration over time. We've looked at kindergarten pictures and there is just, there is a difference in the acceptance rate of care, carrying more pounds. Um, I think there are individuals that recognize that, but, but as a society, it's kind of the thermostat has been turned up with what is acceptable. Let me also share, and, and I, I don't do this with any intent to be pejorative, but our, our supply line of our clothes has also changed. A medium today, is not what a medium was 30 years ago because the, the salespeople in the uh, retail stores want, particularly for women's clothes, for the medium to still be a medium, not make you go to a large. So what they've done is they've made the mediums grow in size as the population has grown in size so that you get to keep wearing that medium even though it's not a medium like it used to be. Uh, so I, I think that's probably the clearest uh, uh, cultural uh, change that we've seen is the acceptance of a heavier weight population. Kendrick, what about on the school level? What are, what, what are you seeing? Uh, you know, is there, I mean, obviously kids can be very cruel to, to each other. And how do you see self-perceptions changing or not changing at that level? Well, on the school level, um, not particularly at my high school, but I know that it's seen that image, you know, is everything. You know, they're trying to figure out, you know, where, where's the next party or who's doing this or what position you hold and all that thing, all, all that type of stuff. And uh, when it comes to school, I know going from, you know, elementary school to middle school and back in New Orleans where, uh, back when I was in elementary school, you know, we had uniforms, but then coming up to, you know, the high school and realizing that you have to now, you know, you don't have uniforms, so you kind of have that self-expression. Well, you know, based on what type of clothes you wear, you know, people are just like, you know, oh, you wear this, so mm, maybe we're going to stray away from you. And it doesn't necessarily generate on the size of things, but it's more of what you wear and who you are. And it seems that people nowadays, you know, are beginning to accept themselves and they're like, you know, I'm okay with the size I am. And even though it's good that you're accepting where you are, you know that that can eventually lead to health problems. And if you are becoming more acceptive of who you are, then you should have that willpower to say, well, maybe I should try and make a difference. That way I'm able to increase my longevity. And that way I know that I'm bettering myself and not only bettering myself, but bettering those around me. Jenny, do you see different, different levels of self-awareness in different parts of the country? I do, and I think, um, I think just to add to what's already been, be, been said um, is a caution, and that's with girls in particular, adolescent, um, early adolescent girls, and not, um, shifting the conversation so much to weight so as to create the opposite effect of disordered eating. So all of our programming that we do at the Alliance for Youth is focused on eating better, moving more, really looking at the behaviors that we want to instill in young people and the lifelong healthy habits that will lead to a normal healthy weight because the studies show if you focus too much on weight gain with girls, you see a lot of disordered eating. So I think that's the one challenge that we have for kids in particular in really balancing the messaging and not creating a lack of self-awareness around the issue because we know that we have a lot of overweight and obese um, young people, one in three, but not creating you know, an unintended consequence by doing so. Let, let me add just because this audience is, is more familiar. You know, we have been measuring the BMIs in kids in schools since 2003, 2004. Uh, and I think one of the things that, that Kendrick kind of alludes to, kids coming in from kindergarten about a third 
are either already obese or overweight. So it is starting earlier than school age, but then it explodes in elementary school, and we have the peak incidence uh, where over 50% of our African American girls at age, uh, you know, uh, fifth, sixth, seventh grades are obese or overweight. And then in high school, I think we see some self-awareness come in and we see the numbers drop off a little bit. Um, we've not seen and we've been worried and have looked for increased um, cases of, of eating disorders and we've not seen that in our, our kids program related to this. It is a caution, it is a concern, but I think what the data are showing is this thing starts before kids get to school, then when they're out from under their parents' influence in the school environment, it explodes until the middle school years. And then some are successful in regaining some control but too many continue on a path like those that we saw in the film and, and are destined to, to an adult life of early disease, early uh, morbidity, and, and unfortunately uh, early mortality. So I think it's an all, it's a full court press and it starts earlier than any of us can kind of imagine. By the time we recognize it, you know, we, we're now in a, we're in a damage control uh, process instead of a prevention process. All right, uh, a couple more, how about Right, since you have the mic right there, that gentleman right there. The comment was made that we know things about food, and the example that comes to mind for me is that about a year ago, my mother was diagnosed with diabetes, and my mother has an undergraduate in physical education, a master's degree in um, education, yet she told me that Nutella was a healthy alternative <laughs> to what I couldn't get out of her. I think she made peanut butter. Um, and I had to tell her mother, it's not what in the bag, it's just chocolate or sugar. Yes, it's low fat because there's nothing but sugar. And you're a diabetic. Eat the peanut butter. Um, oddly enough, there's a $2.5 million lawsuit that California just won because it's false advertising. They're advertising. So this idea of we know, can I get some comments about when the people can just flat out start suing food companies or their advertising, whether it's to children, whether it's a lie, you know, the idea of we know is that it's our responsibility, but at what point is it the corporation's responsibility to have accurate advertising? Uh, I, 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 like, I'm not a lawyer, so I guess I, I, I can't say exactly when people can or cannot. I guess we are in a situation where, you know, uh, as a, a community, and I'm talking of a community as a nation, we have to weigh uh, uh, what we might consider as our own individual responsibilities, our rights and responsibilities, you know, relative to what, you know, uh, is good for society as a whole. Uh, so it's one of those situations, I think uh, you talked about, uh, you know, the situation at the company when you first started this issue and uh, the employees were saying, oh God, you know, what, what are you going to tell us what to eat now? And we've seen that even in uh, looking at the, uh, uh, the program that I was just talking about, the uh, communities putting prevention to work. We went to audit uh, uh, a vending machine. We were going to take a measurement of what's in there so that we'll see once the policies pass, we'll look at it again, see if there's a change. And people were complaining, oh gosh, you guys are going to tell us what to drink. Uh, so it's one of those situations, and I'm not quite sure whether, you know, uh, I'm in a position to say when a person can sue the government or not. I think it will, a lot will depend on, you know, the person's situation, what kind of facts they have at hand. Now that we are becoming more aware of, you know, some of the factors that lead to, you know, these situations, I'm sure there will be some really good lawyer out there who can, you know, tell you that this is a good time to sue. Let me, let me offer a little bit of a distinction between tobacco and the obesity issue. The tobacco master settlement that was alluded to came about after the discovery of board level documents that showed that tobacco companies had marketed to youth, which has always been illegal. So they got caught with a smoking gun, which then led to the unraveling of their scientific evidence that showed that they knew that nicotine was addictive and they marketed it to youth so that they would have lifelong addicted users of their product. I don't think that's likely to be present yet in the food industry. I think we're just discovering this obesity issue. It could be. There's no question that foods have been manipulated in their salt content or in their sugar content to increase consumerism, con consumer consumption. But I think the link that, you know, a single 
product causes obesity is not going to be present. So there's going to have to be a standard set of what does constitute healthy versus unhealthy foods, and then there's going to have to be that chicken and egg thing, demand and supply, where we take responsibility for our own future by pursuing the healthier foods once that's been defined. The case you met was clearly false advertising. For those who don't know, it was advertised as a, a I think it was a breakfast spread or something that was uh, uh, supposed to be healthy. Uh, but when somebody looked at the contents, they could say, this is actually no healthier. I've forgotten what they compared it to in the lawsuit. It was something that was pretty, pretty abrasive in terms of, uh, uh, but that's going to be the, the tactic that has to be taken is that when somebody makes a claim, what's the standard that it's put against? And, and what's the lever that you can use to actually combat that? You talk about our accidental food jokes, and you just said the tobacco companies were caught with a smoking gun. I just realized that. <laughs> uh, this side. How about right in the back, right where she is on the aisle there? From all indications, I think we're still at the policy and academics not taking it per se to the audience that we need to take it to. Um, I came to the United States when uh, at the dawn of HIV AIDS. And I remember uh, at the policy level it was not working. It was like the message was not getting across. And I remember that the faith-based community was involved to target the population that suffered the most. And the South was not seeing a decline in HIV AIDS spread. So when I read, if obesity is such an epidemic, as we've been told and alluded to, when is that going to happen to involve the faith-based community? I, I think, you know, the faith-based community is particular its leadership has been a gap in our strategy that we need to fill in. South Carolina has done a pretty good job of trying to uh, mobilize and recruit the faith-based leaders, particularly from African American churches, where the where the the, uh, the leader there has a has a voice uh, that that frequently carries uh, carries influence far beyond any other avenue. So, so I do think not only getting the leader's voice and understanding, but also the practices of the church. I mean, we've, uh, you mentioned the, the potlucks. Uh, we need to figure out how we have potlucks where we share healthy recipes, not just the best tasting recipes. Uh, and the church could be a really important avenue for that. Jenny, what are, you, are you with the Alliance's efforts? Do you see some connections with faith-based outlets? What we've seen is uh, that schools that we work with work with their local faith-based communities uh, through different events, usually, and through after-school programming, and really partnering up with after-school programming. But I, I would tend to agree that uh, the strategies thus far have not been at scale or even replicable. It's really based on relationships in that local community, and it is a gap in our strategy and one that we should really look at, uh, both um, from the perspective of the opportunity to do more after school programming for kids, to open up facilities. We often talk about joint use between schools and communities. Why not joint use around faith-based organizations and, and communities to really open those up for physical activity events, but also really looking at kind of the culture of potlucks or, or some events and, and what can change from a thought leadership perspective. You wanted to get in? Yeah, well, I, I'll add that, you know, probably uh, as far as obesity is concerned, uh, they, there has been some effort, you know, there's still more to be done, but I think there has been some effort to go beyond just, you know, the academics, people sitting in office and maybe the policymakers. There has been an effort to get a community involved. For instance, I think in the state here, we have ACOP, Arkansas Coalition on Obesity Prevention which is, uh, you know, uh, run through the state, but it involves, you know, people in the community. I know there's an effort right now on a coordinated uh, chronic health, uh, you know, initiative at the Department of Health, and uh, it's, you know, entirely, almost entirely uh, uh, 
part of it is to get the communities involved. So they are working with different communities in the, in the state to make it work. So uh, there's still more to be done, but I think there is really the, the recognition that you cannot do this on, on your own. Uh, for, I also talked about uh, communities putting prevention to work. The first name is communities. They realize that it is important. So we got time for one more question, I think. Um, oh, it's so much stress. Okay, you sir, right there in the third row. He put his hand up high, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> He's not a plant. We've never met before. Right now. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, I'm actually um, I volunteer with um, and I'm not affiliated with the city whatsoever. But just as a local follow-up, I volunteer with the Little Rock uh, Bike Friendly Community, and uh, we today just passed uh, a form of complete streets, which is a um, thing that we're going to submit to the mayor. And basically, if you're not familiar with complete streets, uh, complete streets, they mentioned it in the movie. Um, it's basically they repay the street or they develop a new street, they're going to take into account pedestrian sidewalks and biking lanes to make sure that it's a complete street. And um, so we're going to submit this to the mayor. And um, as I'm sure plenty of studies have shown, uh, if you have safe alternatives, and the river trail is a good example of this, if you have safe trails, to be active, people will use them. So I am basically kind of reaching out to everyone here after watching this uh, to push the mayor, push the board of directors to uh, see that this actually gets done. And moreover, uh, it's on the developer side um, so that once it is implemented, that we actually make sure that it's actually getting done uh, because you know having a walkable, bikeable society is something uh, the website is actually it's a national organization called CompleteStreets.org is the website that you can go to. And you can actually implement that, not just in Little Rock, it's actually already implemented in Northern Rock, but any community that you might be in. Um, any final comments from anyone? Any wrap-up thoughts? I, I have one. I think this film really does demonstrate the level of investment and, and activity that we're going to have. One of the things that in our state strategy we're trying to do is to recruit new mayors to a, a, a program we call Growing Healthy Communities. We now have 17 mayors that have committed. They frequently do reach out to the school superintendent or the corporate leader, or I think we need to encourage them to reach out to the faith-based leaders. And so we've got 17 communities across our state that are committed to trying to make these changes. They're not as big always. Sometimes it's just a light bulb or a basketball net at the local park uh, that gets people out still and doing that. But I'd love to take this film, which we now have 40 copies of, and add 40 more growing healthy communities to our cadre over the course of the next two months. Uh, and to start moving this thing out and getting many, many more people like you are already aware and, and activated in our efforts. So if you've got a mayor, that's not part of a, of a growing healthy community, give him a ring. Anyone else? Anything you want to add? It, it debuts this month. I haven't seen the precise times on uh, HBO.com. They usually print their schedule pretty well. And, and oh. It debuts on May 14th, and they're go. opening up the signal that week so that... So if you don't have HBO, you, you can, can still get HBO. watch it. Yes, so they're opening up the signal so that it'll be available publicly. There you go, May 14th and 15th. Okay. I'm not sure it's going to be open for all their other programming, ah, but... Uh, yes. <laughs> no Game of Thrones for everyone, sorry. <laughs> if we have a hand for our panel, please. They did a great job tonight. Kendrick is nice to meet you, man.